Hello there, short friends. This is going to be a review and destructive test of this Ryujin series 1095 Shinogi Zukuri with Bohi Katana. It's from their Kengo series, or at least that's what this little paper right here says, though I can't find any reference to this Kengo thing anywhere else anywhere else online. Anyway, before I get into the thick of it, there are a few things that I need to note. One, Ryujin reached out to me and asked me to do a review on this product, or asked me rather if I would be interested, and I said yes please. I noted that in my earlier uh, first impressions video, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. The important bit to note is that this sword was sent to me for free, and obviously it's in a state of disrepair now, I'll elaborate on that, but it was sent out to me for uh, from Ryujin, I didn't have to pay for it, they're not expecting it back. That's part of the reason why I do destructive testing, is not to say they asked me for it, <laughs> to do that, which is another, I suppose, important bit. Ryujin didn't demand that I break it or anything like that, it was just one of those things where I feel a little weird about getting a free sword and not you know, and keeping something of value at the end of it and how that might influence opinions and stuff. So I, I do a destructive test on it. I suppose I could give it away too, but I don't know. I still feel weird about that. If I'm if I'm being asked to do a review, I figure it's probably most helpful to push the sword to the point of, of breaking and, uh, and have that be an informative process along the way, at least as much as I can. I know some folks kind of wince when destructive testing is done, so I'm, I'm sorry that was kind of the the destination of this free sword that was sent to me. So uh, the other bit is I picked out the kind of colors and th themes and all that kind of stuff. So if you think things don't thematically go together or you think it's ugly, you can give most of that blame to me because I told them to make it this way and uh, I will elaborate on that process a little bit as well. The last thing I think I need to know is that I am not an expert in this stuff. I'm a hobbyist enthusiast. All around I'm jazzed about swords, but I admit that I am I am not the world's foremost or even the world's not foremost expert. I am just a just a guy who's interested in swords. Uh, so take what you hear in this review with a grain of salt. They're my thoughts, my opinions, and and really not a whole lot more than that. If you think I missed anything or you have comments, throw them in the thingy down below. Uh, smarter people than me will probably chime in and correct my whoopsie doodles. Anyway, on with the rest of the review. The first thing that I actually want to talk about is, I suppose, on the internets. Uh, so if I switch over to Ryujin's homepage over here, uh, this is uh, Ryujin Sword, and not to be confused actually with Ryujin Swords, if I just go ahead and add a little S onto this guy here, oh, well, no, that doesn't work. Ha! This is a different web page. The point is is that you want to be sure you're typing Ryujin Sword and not Ryujin Swords, or you might go to the wrong place. Uh, I went over to here to options, and when I was first approached, uh, I asked, you know, can I go through the process of asking you know for a particular type of sword and then to kind of measure how closely you hit the mark for what I asked for. I think that's a kind of interesting process. So as I was looking on the website, even though the representative from the company that I spoke with did mention they use other steels, um, I, I kind of limited myself to, to what I could see here just because frankly it was what I could see. Uh, as I look at other websites, I do see that there are a myriad of other products and steels and types and stuff used by Ryujin. I have T10, there's 1045 but I, I kind of stuck with what I could see on their website, which was 1095. And oddly, it is noted as the Kengo series on the sword certificate, but I don't see reference to that really much of anywhere else. Anyway, I got one of these. I got it in the 29.5 inch variety. It's a sword with a bohi. They also have one without a bohi. Then they have a shobu zakuri. Notably, at least from what I can tell from this very small photo, the ridge line actually goes all the way to the tip, which I like to see in shobu zakuri blades. Uh, then they have this, I don't even know how to say this, Kanamuro Toshi. It looks like what is commonly called unukobori, unukobi zakuri, or so, something to that effect, but it's like this naginata influence, this polearm influence style, where it has this kind of partial bohi at the bottom, then the spine kind of tapers in a little bit, and it makes for a very, very nimble feeling uh, blade with a, with a, I don't know, it's a cool looking shape though. Nevertheless, I got one of these shinogi zakuri with bohi type things. I thought it was pretty much the, the standard shape, uh, or at least what, what is very cliche in my mind when I think of katana, rather than doing uh, something a little bit more zazzy, even though I do love zazz. I picked out a, a suba, and what I will say, just in general, uh, note here, I really like the assortment of suba that they have. Now some of these seem very influenced by like the, the wind and thunder or other products that I've seen on the market, but the patina that they have on these things is, is actually reasonably nice. Um, at least with this, this is kind of like a look of, I don't know if you call it goto, but this, uh, th this, this is supposed to probably look like, not Shibuichi, but sh 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 
Chu, I can't remember the name, it's the Gold and Copper Mix. Shakudo! Jeez, I can't remember things very well. Anyway, uh, it's supposed to be this kind of deep black patinaed stuff, and, and don't get me wrong, this completely misses the, the thing that it's trying to emulate, but compared to many other mass production Chinese pieces, I think the, the patina on here is prettier. Uh, the, the gold leaf, uh, or at least the gold embellishments, don't seem to be as muddily placed, uh, which doesn't give me this feeling of overly gaudy disaster, which I, which I often tend to, tend to see. I don't know, this one kind of looks like a little bit of a gaudy disaster. But I am, I am kind of going off point. These are aesthetic, you know, rambly personal things that don't really, you know, you like it or you don't like it, and that's, that's fine. If you like any of these and I don't, that's fine. It's subjective. Ultimately, it serves the purpose. I just want to point out that I have criticized this kind of look in the past, and I think these guys get a little bit closer. The, the, they could be crisper, they could be better, but I, I think overall I'm, I'm actually reasonably happy with the look for the price. Moving on, I also picked out a ska. It looks like they have different colors. There's not a lot of assortments of fittings and things to choose from, and I will admit when I asked for the longer blade, they, they were a little remiss trying to give me the ten and a half inch handle, so I did ask for that to happen. They did follow through, but, um, you know, it, it generally speaking, I guess people that order the, the longer katana get the longer handle, and I I personally don't want that, but uh, I guess it's not a common thing. Also, the Saya, they have quite a few options here. This is the one I chose, this red with pearl inlay. Um, I thought that, you know, I'd, I'd seen rattan wrapped and samegawa wrapped and some other, some other fun stuff and basic colors, but this inlay of pearl is, is a chance to kind of see how well does the stain look, how good a wood is underneath there, and also how well do they match transitions on this kind of spirally pearl inlay. Does it look good? Uh, so I thought that this would be fun, plus I don't think I've ever done a red-colored sword project. So anyway, this is what I got. Now, the tricky bit is, as I look on all of these websites, uh, there's not really a great idea about what they cost. Um, on Ryujin's website, uh, it, it's, it's not quite there either. Um, so I think, I'm going to go off the baseline that this sword is $500. That's, that's kind of what I can find from the MSRP. Uh, it could be a little bit less than that, but I'm going to kind of put in my mind, I'm going to compare it and contrast it to other swords that are $500. Now, there are other websites online where you could find uh, something similar from this type of series, maybe made from a different steel for $400 or $200, but they weren't quite the same. Anyway, the long and the short of it is I am thinking about this as a $500 sword in my brain. So as I'm comparing and contrasting it, I'm thinking about it as the kind of upper mid-range of, of sword prices. Uh, $100 to $200 seems to be the, the really base level. You can get stuff for under $100, but it's it's uh, tough to find and, and kind of obvious in terms of quality typically, uh, or it's tactical or it's something. Uh, anyway, I digress. Entry level tends to be $100 to $200. Mid-range, you know, the, the low mid-range starts to be around $300. Mid-range is, is, you know, four, 450, 500, you're starting to go the upper mid-range of swords, and then you're well into the, you know, kind of upper to lower high end around $800. So it's, you're in the ballpark of, of kind of high mid, I guess, as, as I think of the mass production Chinese market. And there's a lot of swords that you can get for around that price. So we'll see how this one stacks up. Now we'll get into the aesthetics and the fit and the finish and all of that kind of stuff part of the review. The first thing I'll start with is the Kashra. The first thing that I'm going to note about the Kashra is just the overall casting quality. And what I see is something that is, you know, marginally muddy. It's not bad, though. It's it's reasonable. I mean, at, at the $500 price point, I think the fittings are actually quite good. I can see details and all of that kind of stuff. The lines are, are clean enough. It's not overly muddy or gross or a, a cast that's been used so much that it's lost all semblance of detail. It's, it's reasonably good, but at the same time, the lines could be cr crisper. It could be cleaner. This kind of lacquer or, or kind of pattern underneath here uh, could be could be marginally better. Uh, still, I think overall it, it does a good job, and I like this actual kind of large hole area here and just the, the general theme of the, the Kashra. I think it actually is a little unique and a little different. It's plain and, and simple at the same time, but not something that I often see. The transitions as well, 
don't line up perfectly. They're not bad. They kind of bunch up at the end here. Uh, and the Kashra at the moment is in a slight state of disarray. And I will, I will elaborate on that in just a moment. But uh, the transitions before I was using the sword uh, weren't quite perfect down here. And that is, is also worth noting. Though I didn't feel the Kashra move bite into my hand at all while I was using it. And one thing that I would point out is a slight difference is if we look at the Kashra as I've kind of turned it around, uh, <laughs> the Ito must be reasonably tight. The construction is just a little bit different here. So you can see that this Kashra has this little peggy tooth thing in it, and that seems to bite into this seam right here. Now the important note as I look at this Sino sword is that you can see these metal, uh, or not metal, this wooden tooth right here, the kashra goes over this part, so this wooden piece really holds the, the kashra on. And this sword doesn't have that kind of assembly, it has this little kind of wedge that gets stuck in here, and it doesn't have any wood braced inside the kashra itself. The kashra isn't, isn't overlapping the two seams, which is a bit of a concern because the kashra is intended to, in part, hold, hold these two seams together. So. The ska is, is two pieces of wood that are kind of put around in a cago, and then this pommel, the kashra, the end piece, kind of over, overlaps the, these two end bits, uh, and it acts as, as something to kind of like this, this metal ring to keep the end together. Uh, subsequently, you're also, in, in a more traditional sense, going to have a full wrap of samegawa, full wrap of, of ray skin will go around just as this nylon is and that will act as something to keep those seams together. Then you have a fuchi up here, the same kind of collar piece that wraps around and again holds the seam together and then you have this silk cord to hold it together so in the end you should have a structurally uh, functional or, or pretty uh, pretty strong piece or handle that's not going to come apart very easily. By removing this collar and keeping just this tab part at the end there's not really any metal circling the the wood here and it gives me some concern about the integrity also very commonly it's not something i can hold against them but these samegawa panels are are panels it's not a full wrap of samegawa so you don't have that kind of structural integrity of the the leather or ray skin wrapped around the handle holding it together so uh, that that is a bit of a concern in terms of integrity uh, a kashra falling off with the type of testing that i've done we'll get to how that happened but it's it's not actually that bad in fact most of the time it comes comes off quite a bit worse. That brings us to the Ito. Now around the Ito you can see that it has loosened around the Kashra, but the remainder of it has stayed pretty consistent. There are some spots that are loose, which I noted in my initial impressions video, and some little spots on it are tight, but either way it really hasn't changed much in terms of the tightness. The uh, Ito also came with a slight stain, but I've noticed that it's absorbed quite a few more stains in the time I've had it. More so than I, I guess I've noticed on other swords, and I, I don't know exactly why, if the material's more porous or more prone to being stained, but I just see it retaining more, I don't know, garbage from my hands that I, I don't normally notice in brown or purple or any of the other color ska that, I've, though in fairness, most of the other colors I get tend to be black, so it's fair that the black doesn't show up on black as much as it does on red. Nevertheless, I want to say that I've, I've had other colors that are lighter than this red sky that don't, don't show oil from my hands as much. The silk also doesn't feel like silk, almost. I don't know. It, feel, it feels almost synthetic in a way, um, but I don't, know, I don't know the truth of that. In terms of shaping, I like the handle shape. It feels good in my hands. It's not too fat, not too skinny. I think they did a good job with the, the overall feel of, of the handle. The Ito also doesn't jet out so much uh, on this. It it's, lies reasonably flat, so the handle feels a good size and the Ito doesn't really contribute to it being too beefy. The Samegawa panels are not great, and towards the end here, they bunch up. I noted this again on my earlier first impressions video. I don't really like that very much, and the, the nodules are pretty small. Though for a $500 sword, they don't need to be great, but there's imperfections. I can see the... Uh, the panel line through here, and I can also, the diamonds are all different shape. Uh, the, I should note as well that on the subject of the diamonds being different shapes, I did uh, have an email from somebody at, uh, at uh, Ryujin Sword after I did my first impressions video saying that this isn't really a systemic problem that they have. They took a picture of another example from inventory and it didn't have the same kind of haphazardly made diamonds, which is good. So I don't know that this is exactly representative of everything you would expect to get from Ryujin, but I only have this one. This is the one they sent me. So I have to kind of judge the sword I have. And in this case, the diamonds are, are I don't know, a little, little lazy eyed. 
Anyway, uh, if we move on to the Fuji, the transitions here aren't as great. Uh, there's a little bit of a ledge, but again, as I was using it, swinging it around, banging it into trees and stuff, I didn't feel any kind of pinches or, or problems with my hand. It never really was an issue. It feels soft, and as I kind of rub my finger on it here, I, it doesn't, you know, it's not aesthetically the best, but it does the job, and I, it's fine. So this is the first time I've taken the handle off, and, you know, honestly, it's actually coming off pretty easy. Uh, didn't have to really beat on it too much. And the thing I'm going to look at is if the ska is cracked. And what I can see is that it is not. I'll try and get some better pictures of this in just a moment. But along the seam, there's, you know, some, some small area where it's marginally separated. But there hasn't, there's no other cracks. It's held up to the punishment I put out on it. And beating, a, beating it against a tree would not surprise me if, if it were to crack. It's also, uh, you know, I can see the, the panels and the outline here. It's reasonably well shaped. The Minukia as well uh, are also reasonably well cast. A lot of times I'll see like really well cast fittings and then the Minuki just look really shitty. Uh, underneath here the Minuki seem to be on par at least with the casting level of the, the rest of the sword. Uh, they're the same gold colors I would see on the Subin thematically. They seem to, to look okay and match reasonably well. I didn't get to pick the Minuki though, so I you know I can't say I'm terribly attached to them, but I do like the overall look. The other thing worth noting is that the Fuchi and the Kasha are both magnetic. And, uh, you know, I guess that means they're made of, of some sort of magnetic material. The Suba is also magnetic, and I don't know that it has the same draw as just a, a bit of iron wood, but in any sense, it is, it is magnetic, so it's made out of some reasonably decent metal. Speaking of the Suba, it's, it's kind of the highlight of the, the fittings in the sword. Uh, I don't know why, maybe it's because I got to pick it, but uh, I think it just it seems to look better than many of the other Suba that I have. It has a marginally raised rim. I don't know if this was a, a wax casting from something made by a Ryujin sword, but in any case, I think they did a good job, and I liked the overall patina and color of the Suba. Uh, it's, it's reasonably reasonably pretty. Um, so anyway, again, that's an aesthetic thing. It does the job of a, of a, you know, a guard or a suba on a Japanese sword. Whether or not you like it is a subjective thing, as is whether or not I like it. So I can't say that uh, how well it looks really contributes anything. But uh, in terms of casting quality, the lines are pretty similar to the Fuchi and Kashra. They could be cleaner, they could be sharper. It looks like it's you know, clearly a mold that's been used a few times. But I think they did a little better job with the gold overlay. It doesn't seem overly crazy or like it's applied by, you know, finger paints. So, well done on the Suba. At least tip my hat there. The Habaki is pretty much the standard old brass Habaki. It fits on there. It held up well. It didn't rattle around. It has like a marginally different curve, but it really just looks like the standard brass Habaki. The Saya. Well, uh, the Saya, the weird thing I can point out here is it's got this spielkes, uh, or some sort of uh, extra goop on the, the Koiguchi mouth here. Uh, extra resin paint lacquer, something that's kind of stuck on there. But other than that, the Saya is actually pretty good. It held the sword well when, I was, <laughs> when it was still uh, intact. It, it did a good job. It didn't rattle all that much. Uh, the wood in here, I don't make out any obvious knots, huge flaws, giant gaps, you know, wood putty that was used as filler. The transitions are also small, but overall they did a great job. Uh, the other thing I suppose I would notice, there are some imperfections or non-circular pieces in the Mother of Pearl. They're, they're tough to see, but you know, like this one looks like a heart. Sometimes they start looking a little more like a blob, uh, or you know, they'll be the random off color. Uh, thing here, and they don't they don't all look as as clean. But again, this is a five hundred dollar sword and a reasonably difficult thing to to do for a size. So uh, all in all, I can't say I'm really complaining. And if I hold this up, you know, to the same kind of light that I would put, you know, the sword on, you can make out not a lot here. It is <laughs> it is not easy to see. Let's see if I can polish it up. Get those fingerprints off there. I don't know if you can see this any better. Uh, but what I can say is here, uh, you can see that it has the wood grain underneath. There's just some texture and depth to this side that I didn't necessarily expect or wasn't able to see in the photo. There's this really nice burgundy wine red color that I can uh, make out the grains and the wood with, even though the grains aren't uh, overly pronounced. I don't know that they're supposed to be in the, the Mother of Pearl. adds some tact. It doesn't look crazy in the Obi or, or too blingy. 
Um, I like it just more than I expected, and it did a reasonable job of being a Saya. Honestly, I found that while I was doing Noto with the Saya, as I was moving it and, and whatnot, it became more and more comfortable the more I used it. It took a little while for some of the sounds that, uh, that I was getting initially to go away, but after about a week of using it, you know, it, it, I, it was much easier to use. Um, I'm surprised that this globby goop didn't come off after a, after about a week of using it, but regardless of how hard I slammed the Suba in here, it never chipped off. The other thing I suppose I can note is that this is the uh, Segeo that comes with it. It's not particularly long or, or anything, so depending on your style, you might need an extra one. The thing I'd note is that it's really kind of skinny. It reminds me of just extra Ito as opposed to a, a specifically made Segeo. It, it's, it, it just feels a, a little little lackluster in terms of what it is. For a $500 sword, again, I'm not going to complain too much, but I think other companies, even at 500 bucks, give you a more purpose-built Segeo than this one. Now the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part. This is the first time I've had the handle off, so there are some things that I'm going to point out about the Nikago, and honestly, I, I think the Nikago is is okay. Uh, there, there's not a lot of file markings or really cleanup work that's done on the Nikago, though I've said this before in other reviews, a lot of people never disassemble the sword, so putting any kind of attention into this when... Uh, when a lot of people, most of your customers at $500 swords never take it off and see it, means that it's a place that you're spending money that maybe you don't have to, and you could add value somewhere else. So uh, this, though, looks reasonably decent. At least, you know, there's there's not a lot of this kind of grind mark, you know, kind of made to, made to fit. Uh, it has an engraving here on this side and on the other, as well as a serial number, which, depending on my light, may or may not come in. I'm sorry, I can't do that here. I didn't say hysteria, I said his serial number. As for the rest of the blade, uh, earlier in the uh, first impressions video I did, I noted that the Hamon is, is, doesn't really stand out a lot. In this light it does, and there is activity and prettiness and cool stuff to see, uh, but it doesn't stand out super well in, in other lights. Uh, the Hamanchi Moonmachi are a little off-center. The other thing that I'm going to note about the blade now, granted, here we got the, the tip, is the termination of the bohi. So you can see I've, I've kind of laid out the, uh, just drawn a line on the actual blade uh, where the bohi ends, and I did so on the other side here. Uh, and you can see they're just, they're just a little off. Um, it's a small detail. It's a small thing, uh, but I, I like to see when the bohi terminates in exactly the same spot, and this one is, is just a little, a little off. Earlier, uh, again, a little tough to see at this point, but the flats of the blade are, are decent and the Yakote uh, is, is not bad. It shows up, I think, better in this camera light, maybe not now that it's been so demolished, but uh, the Yakote and the Kasaki were at one point pretty handsome looking pieces. And overall, uh, the shape of the blade, I think they did a pretty decent job shaping the blade. Now, as I talk about the remainder of the blade, this is supposed to be 1095 steel, and I'll talk about that just a little bit later. I have no real way of verifying if it is or isn't. What I can show you is this piece. This is what was supposed to be in the blade versus what I got. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this point and, and how close is it to, to what I got. So let's look at what's on this card. The thing I want to draw your attention to first is this blade length. It says 29 and a half inches. It's not actually 29 and a half inches, 28 and a half inches. Uh, Japanese swords are typically measured from formerly where the tip was uh, to the moon machi right here, this little shoulder where the habaki meets meets the the blade, um, and that's the the length of the the blade. And so when it says 29 and a half, it's actually 28 and a half, and that extra inches in the habaki. I can't necessarily blame a person for doing that, though many of the people that would buy a sword uh, may think that it's measured from tip to guard, not tip to some uh, you know random point on the habaki. Uh, but nevertheless, that's how Japanese sword lengths, uh, blade lengths are typically measured. So uh, if I was trying to buy a 29 and a half inch sword, that would be the way I would expect it to be measured. Anyway, I, I, I get it, I get it, but it would be nice if it were called out somewhere specific. The other thing I suppose I can note is on this side, we talk about some of the thicknesses, and these are off a little bit. It makes me wonder if my caliper is off or theirs, but more than that, uh, w well within acceptable tolerances. But this is almost kind of saying, 
this is what this blade is, and I get the impression that the, nobody actually measured this specific sword. Though again, for $500, I don't know that I can really expect anyone to have measured in detail this particular sword. Uh, the weight is two and a half pounds on the sheet. I got two pounds, seven ounces, which is just a little under 2.5 pounds, 16 ounces a pound. So it's just, just a hair under two and a half uh, pounds. Again, within, within acceptable variance. Um, 2.5 pounds is a little weird when you put it that way versus two pounds x many ounces. I think that's two pounds eight ounces. Um, so being off an ounce, just as as for clerical sake, um, an ounce. This is two ounces of steel, the tip that broke off. So uh, if there's an ounce missing, I think that's probably within within reason. Uh, but just to give you a visual idea of of what an ounce or two is, this is this is two ounces. So presumably about yay much steel is is about an ounce of steel. So if, if this much steel is more or less in your blade, uh, you know, kind of spread over the, the overall uh, blade length, it, it can have some dynamic property changes and, um, and can also just be more for you to move around. So I, I, I think weight is a pretty important thing to, to get down in terms of how much things weigh, though I understand, uh, you know, there could be a lot of variance even with the, the minimal amount of hand stuff that might go into these ones. The other thing is it says T10 1095 high carbon steel uh, and this is where I find it interesting as I was noting earlier it's easy to find things in T10 but I don't necessarily know 1095 and I don't know if T10 is 1095 I guess I don't know enough about it but in the past when I've done cutting with swords that were 1095 they were they were generally a little bit more brittle uh, than than some of the other swords so as I would do sword on sword contact it wouldn't be uncharacteristic for chunks of the sword to kind of break off uh, not chunks, but along the hamon, pieces were more likely to break off rather than, as you can see here, uh, kind of do this rolling, shouldery bend in. There would be larger chunks and bits missing. So I, I don't know exactly what the difference between T10 and 1095 is, but I venture I guess it must be something. This one acted different than other 1095 swords, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But I find it interesting that this card says T10. 1095, I don't know, maybe whatever the hell we wanted to. Also, I need to note something else. Earlier I was talking about silk, and uh, up here it says that it was using red cotton. Unfortunately, I realize now that I don't really know what material it was. I was taking for granted that it was uh, silk, but it's entirely possible that this is cotton. Well, it's probably more than possible it likely is. Uh, it doesn't have a very soft feeling. It feels um, a little slicker than other cotton you know, sub uh, other cotton scows that I've had on Ito and stuff from Japan. Uh, this feels, but it gives me the idea that maybe it's some sort of synthetic cotton material or something like that. Though that may account for why it's a little bit more porous. I suppose cotton is supposed to be that more than silk. I don't really know. I'm not a materials expert. In any case, this is likely a cotton ska or a cotton Ito rather than silk. The next thing to note is that it says the Suba is a 1045 steel Suba and then brass fuchi kashira uh, brass sepa, brass habaki, um, and the fuchi and kashir are magnetic. Now the sepa are brass, and the thing to note is that uh, they're they're not magnetic. So um, I don't I don't think the fuchi and kashira are made out of brass because uh, because they're magnetic. Which I guess brings into question what is this thing actually? And don't get me wrong. First of all. From a review standpoint, or just a, a consumer standpoint, I like these things. I think they, they make a good frame, they're pretty cool. Um, I, I like having some sort of certificate of authenticity as a collector standpoint. I think in any case, uh, if you're not a collector, and later on, years later, you forget what your sword is, this gives you some idea if you go to resell it, go to have it serviced, or something like that. It's nice to have uh, a piece of paper, and it also doesn't cost a huge amount of money to do this kind of stuff, but I suppose if you're going to provide something, it's nice to call it accurate. Now that there's, you know, the 29 and a half inch thing, uh, the weight being off just a little bit, the fittings having different material names, it brings into question things I can't verify. I don't know how to verify hardness along the spine and back really effectively. Uh, is it actually cotton or is it something else? It just makes me question some of the other stuff that's actually on here and makes it less valuable to me. Now don't get me wrong, uh, there's a myriad of reasons that this may not match the one that I had. Maybe it was intended for a different sword and just got put in my box. Or maybe uh, my sword had some adjustment that was done to it before it was sent out and it used to, to, to be this or have a different handle or something like that on it. In any case, uh, I don't think you should have to do some like post-mortem analysis to, to have the right paperwork. 
with stuff. I, I mean, I'm guessing that the manufacturer would probably correct it if I asked them to, but uh, anyway, it's, it's a little bit, it's cool that it comes with it, but it's a little bit of a bother that it's inaccurate. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how the blade feels when you're using it. And there's two elements, two schools of thought here. One is the, the cutting aspect of it, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The first is, though, kata and doing uh, iaido, just kind of swinging it around. And the sword really grew on me here. I didn't necessarily like it at first, but after a couple weeks of using it, the saya had a better fit. Um, I got used to doing, you know, noto and, and moving it around, and then I realized that it has a, a semi-similar feeling to my Hanwei bamboo mat in that it's... It was, it's not as tip heavy now, but it was at one point kind of a tip heavy feeling sword. Uh, and not so much, it's, it's right on that line where it's almost too heavy to use, but it's just light enough where you can use it as, as kind of a, a way to, to push yourself in your exercises. And it, it reminds me of my bamboo man in that way, which I really, really like. And so we became pretty fast friends after a week or so of, of dicking around with it. Um, unfortunately, it's it's much less tip heavy now because it's broken. But uh, for a time, I, I actually enjoyed doing doing Noto with it. It wasn't wasn't bad at all. It was a comfortable sword to use. Uh, it didn't cut me, bite me, do anything bad as I was using it. The grip was comfortable. Um, you know, I, I spent I spent some time using the blade, and overall, I, I became very very comfortable doing doing Noto with it, uh, or doing kata, doing forms, that type of stuff. Just swinging it around and not into anything else. Uh, though I will say that this type of sword is, is probably not necessarily for everyone and I wish I had taken the weapon dynamics computer which is another point I should make I don't have that slide for you or that information because I broke the sword before I took those measurements I thought I had taken them and it turns out I did not so review or fail on my part I can't do that accurately though I do have other measurements and hopefully they help paint a picture of how the sword feels it's a little tip heavier than most people are going to like that's really what I can say, though that changes around a lot depending on the size of sword you get. If I got a sword that was shorter with a longer handle, the balance properties would change around substantially. And since this is you know, something where you gotta kinda pick and match your own, I don't know that there's necessarily one formula where you can say Ryujin swords always feel this way. This one that I got felt a little tip heavy, but in the right way to me. The next school of thought is cutting. And it didn't go terribly well here, uh, <laughs> not just because of obvious reasons. The first thing I did cutting-wise was I brought it to, to the dojo and I did some tatami mat cutting in class, and it didn't go well. Now, bear in mind, it cut tatami, but when I tried to let the sword do the work and threw the tip out and tried to let the sword move through, it didn't. Uh, and you can see I can kind of take my fingers and scuff them along the parts of the edge that I haven't really bruised, uh, and I don't pull back bloody little nubs. So it's it's just not as sharp as it needs to be to do that kind of kind of cutting. Um, again, I could throw it and move through to Tommy, but it took a lot of gusto and some, you know, I had to lean into it to do that, and that makes it hard to do cutting well. Now, in, in that type of kenjutsu, that type of swordsmanship, cutting through tatami isn't the challenge. You can make it through tatami, but cutting through tatami at a good angle, uh, cleanly, uh, precisely, you know, controlling your edge and stopping after you move through the tatami, those are the challenging parts, not just moving through. And it took gusto, and all I was really able to do is muster getting through the mat as opposed to doing it well. Uh, so I didn't necessarily enjoy tatami cutting. Frankly, I cut more mats than I wanted to. I didn't bring a spare sword. I expected this one to do better. Uh, and if I had brought a different sword with me, I probably would have stopped after one or two mats just to have some test footage to show you. But I, I didn't enjoy cutting tatami. Now later, I tested it on pool noodles, water bottles, and oddly, it cut those surprisingly well. Now pool noodles especially are surprising because if you don't have a sharp edge uh, and, and good alignment, then the pool noodle kind of laughs at you. It's not a challenge to cut through, it's just you gotta have the right edge geometry. If you come off 
bad or your edge isn't sharp, then it, it doesn't kind of move move through it. it. It's a deceptively difficult target to cut uh, and very embarrassing when it goes awry because it you know, kind of laughs at you. Uh, anyway, the, the point is that uh, it cut through the tummy. You kind of hear it tearing through a little bit, but it, it cut through, not the tummy, the pool noodle uh, better than it did the tatami. Uh, water bottles weren't really much of a challenge. And after that, I kind of I kind of thought that I answered the question after these tests, you know, does it do what it's intended to do? And cutting water bottles, cutting pool noodles went reasonably well, though that's not a mark of quality for a sword. Tatami, I think it could do better with a, a more refined edge, but not the greatest. So I moved on to some silly stuff. Uh, cutting beer cans, it actually uh, was really easy to hold through cutting, you know, large clumps of water uh, until I got a little overzealous and, and it went awry. Uh, I tried to cut through a can of shaving cream and uh, I made a mess. And that's the first time I, cutting beer cans and stuff little left little defamation in the uh, in the planes of the blade. But it wasn't until I started cutting uh, the the shaving cream cans that I got any kind of actual edge deformation or a little bits of rolling in the edge. After that, you know, I took it to some brush, I took it to some other, other mean, mean targets, whacked it into a stump. I also brought out a rolled wet newspaper. Now this is a pretty wide, thick rolled wet newspaper. It's about six inches thick all in all and is a core with a, a wooden dowel in it. And I stuffed some small twig in there or something like that as well just for a little more fun. And I tried to cut it with the Ryujin 1095 sword and you can kind of see it didn't go necessarily well. For comparison's sake here, I've also brought out a Citadel Katana. It's a much, much more expensive sword, but just to show the difference between a sword that cuts this type of material really well uh, versus not, so you know it's not some impossible task. Another test cut that I did, which admittedly is not historically relevant or accurate or applicable to anything as a, as a point of note, but I took some rolled wet newspapers, some tatami scraps, and I stuffed an old pair of snow pants. It's nylon and it's multi-layered and I figured, well, why not just use this as a as a means to try and cut through. And it offered a lot of resistance. The sword did not cut very well through it. It could pierce if I poked into it, but it didn't cut very well. Uh, there's another section that I basically covered with a gutter guard, and it's not supposed to represent chain mail or anything like that. It's a very mild steel. It's not intended to be armor in any way. Uh, but even this very mild steel didn't, you know, offered basically a lot of protection. It didn't cut through at all. And so, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, it didn't cut through. Plus side, though, uh, from these tests, I didn't really see any edge deformation, and I was testing another sword alongside this, uh, a softer sword made out of 1045, I think, and it did show edge deformation. Just as a case in point, you can see the, the two swords here, and one showing edge deformation, and one, one not showing edge deformation from the same material. And overall, I was really surprised at how well the blade held up. It, it after intentionally trying to bend it, frankly, in the stump of a tree, uh, it has a lot more spring there for something that isn't 
through hardened. This is supposed to take a set on a, on a bad cut. It's, it's soft along the spine and thus doesn't necessarily spring back, but it had more, uh, more resilience than I expected it to. And even though it took a set after intentionally trying to make it take a set, it didn't take one as substantially or easily as, as I would have thought it would. Um, and this is where I, I question the 1095 part of, of the blade and the T10. I don't know the difference between those steels or, or what it is, but other 1095 blades that I've had, if I was trying to bend it, they would take a bend much more easily. And uh, as, if I was trying to whack, do sword on sword contact, which I did later on, uh, chunks, larger bits would kind of break off as the edge is, is more brittle. Um, also, bad cuts with a 1095 blade in the past have left me with uh, some some sort of you know bend, and I was able to whack this into a stump and do all sorts of really abusive stuff, and it didn't it didn't really take a bend very easily. I, I had lots of bad cuts with this sword before, really I saw any kind of canter in in the blade, which was very impressive. It was a very uh, for a 1095 a very hard edged blade. It's it's it was remarkably resilient, and I, I actually appreciated that. So later I brought it to do some sword on sword contact with my sword chopper here. This is the broken Sino sword that I had and I did edge on edge contact for some time. And you can see I really marred up the edge. And then after a couple strikes along the back, I was finally able to get the edge to break. Now I'll show you a closer image of this, but this is the, the grain size of the uh, of what's in the steel. And it's, you know, to me, not being a metallurgist, it looks like the grain is, is not completely overdone, but not, uh, maybe not quite as small, small as it should be. Uh, so in terms of heat treatment, some of the metallurgist folks out there might be able to give you more information about how good or bad it is. It was a lot of fun to cut with and, and test, but the thing that I suppose impressed me most wasn't necessarily how well it cut, but how well it stood up to punishment being what it is, which made me debate if it's worth actually, you know, resharpening the blade if you get one of these, uh, because 1095 is supposed to be a pretty durable edge, and I didn't, I didn't, I can't argue with that. Slapping it into beer cans and stuff didn't do any edge rolling at all. It wasn't until I did really abusive, stupid shit to it that there was actually problems. So resilience, I was pretty impressed, but uh, cutting ability was a little disappointed, specifically on Tatami. Now is the part where I tell you if I think it's worth it or not, and uh, you know, hopefully the video, photos, rambling that I've done has helped you answer that question for yourself. But it's my video, and I'm gonna tell you what I think anyway. Anyway, if you're not interested, you can tune out here. <laughs> Short answer is no, I don't think it's worth $500, and that's not because it's a rip-off or did a bad job, uh, it's just that there are a lot of other amazing products. A few years ago this would totally be a killer for $500, but now uh, other products like the Minatoshi Performance Cutter that I got to test from Sword Friend Brian was uh, pretty good. They got a lot of fit and finish. I like the, the feeling of the handle. The diamonds were more even fit and finish wise. It did a better job and it was an amazing cutter specifically though for Tatami. It, though I would say you could probably find a Minatoshi blade of a similar profile and I would stand to, to argue that the, the fit and finish level would probably be quite similar at least if you were looking at the same price point. The pieces from Skydro that I tested were usually are above $500 by some, some amount though many of them were pretty close to that ballpark. They also cut really well, they also felt good in the draw, they also felt good doing any kind of kata. Uh, the fit and finish was also better, the diamonds were easier, easier, <laughs> more even, the Ito was tighter. So there, there were things that I, I think other brands have just hit the mark a little better. Even Hanwei, um, I don't know that the fit and finish is always better on Hanwei, frankly. I think it's pretty on par with what Hanwei uh, often does, though I haven't ever seen you know, the bunched up Samegawa panels. I have seen chewed up panels on Hanwei, uh, and I've seen uneven diamonds and axe handles on Hanwei. So fit and finish wise, I think they're pretty close. The Hanwei probably has a little bit crisper, better cast fittings. Um, 
but Hanways tend to be sharper and I've had better luck cutting tatami kind of straight out of the gate with many of the blades that I've had from Hanway. The redeeming factor for this is that uh, if this is a 1095 blade, it held up really well resilience wise. It took a lot of really abusive stuff before I noticed any edge deformation. It wasn't until I cut into an aerosol or a shaving cream can that I actually got edge roll and it, you know, I beat it against a log and then started to see you know, some minor canting in the edge or in the in the bend or in the straightness of the blade. And it wasn't until I really wrenched on it that I was able to get a, you know, sizable kind of performance altering bend. Uh, so resilience and shock resistance wise, I, I'm actually pretty impressed with this compared to other 1095 blades that I've had, though that's not necessarily just enough. Uh, I, I want something that's good in the cut and that uh, is, is fit and finish wise quite good. The other thing that I have to say is I did bond a little bit with the sword. I was sorry to kill it and see it go. Um, I like the, the feeling of this. It had a tip heavy feeling to me that was that walked that edge really, really well. It's tough for me to find a blade that I like that's still tip heavy. They tend to get kind of grotesquely tip heavy and, and be cumbersome to move around and I, I don't want to use them. So walking that line for me where it's just tip heavy enough where it challenges me but doesn't make me not want to use it is tough and this this one kind of had that though as a guy that's reviewed a few swords I don't know that the next sword will have that weight distribution even if you order one with the same measurements as this I don't know if it's going to feel the same the misplacement or changing of an ounce can make a big difference and uh, this one just seemed to, to hit it for me personally but I do like the dynamics and how how it feels I'm sorry I'm not able to to reproduce it, especially because I like it and I think it offers something interesting I feel a little bit like a heel for not having the weapon dynamics computer to more accurately articulate that for you in any respect, um, overall still, I'd have to say no at 500 bucks. I think there are some other options out there. Uh, if Ryujin can offer a sword that has a little bit cleaner sharpness ready to do to comet to Tommy cutting, and if what the, the rep there said is true and that the fit and finish is often better, maybe it's going to be different, but I'm, I'm left with the judging the sword that I have. And if uh, this specific example is 500 bucks, I'd be, I'd be a bit disappointed with it, just in contrast to other things. I don't, I'm not saying it's a ripoff though. There are a lot of really good things. It's still a good sword. It held up really, really well. And I had to beat the piss out of it for it to break. So in that respect, they, they did a good job. I don't think it's a ripoff for 500 bucks. I just think that there's, given the other options that are out there, uh, there's some that I, I personally find more compelling. Anyway, that's what I have for the review. I hope it's been mildly entertaining, helpful. And uh, if you have any questions, if you think I missed something, throw it in the commentary below. That's all I got. As always, cheers and thanks for watching. Uh, dollar sword, which would kind of be the entry level price point, uh, and it's it's not. It seems to do the job. <coughs> Motherfucker.